Can I have a, can I, can I get your attention, please? The, uh, the video you just watched is by the graffiti artist called Blue, and the soundtrack was John Coltrane's famous My Favorite Things. And we're about to do one of my favorite things. We're about to listen to Lord Adair Turner. Adair Turner is the chairman of the UK Financial Services Authority. He's also the chairman of the UK Climate uh, Change Committee. He's also the chairman of the, uh, what I think it's called, Crucial Committee for Regulatory Reform within the Financial Stability Board. And tonight he's going to talk about economics after the crisis, objectives and means. Uh, it is also the title of his Lionel Robbins Memorial Lecture, which was delivered in three parts last October and will soon be published by MIT Press. I uh, have to say that uh, Lord Turner has been a tremendous friend from the outset. And while we don't give tenure at INET, <laughs> you know how George Soros doesn't believe in creating that kind of security. <laughs> I didn't tell my wife that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if there were such a thing as tenure, on this Saturday night one year ago at King's College, that man would have earned it. And I will tell you, throughout the year, with all the speakers and all the vitality that's come forward on our website, the most embedded, the most requested, the most hits, any measure you want, that we've had in the history of INET was Adair Turner's speech last year. So I think it's fair to say, backed by popular demand, <laughs> Lord Adair Turner. <laughs> Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Rob, for that uh, very nice introduction. Uh, being introduced by Rob is at the same time both uh, flattering and extremely worrying, because uh, one is not quite sure that one can live up to Rob's expectations. Um, what I'm going to try and do this evening is to sort of step back and send out some fairly general thoughts about the nature of what the problems are that economics should think about and the way that it should think about them. Uh, and that means that I'm not going to say much on the subject that you might think uh, that I'm going to report to you on, which is the progress on financial stability reforms. And that is partly because if I was to talk about financial stability reforms, I would be duplicating uh, the excellent session this afternoon on large complex financial institutions. A session which I have to say was very heartening for me because it both uh, confirmed my own beliefs, but also, uh, as it were, put um, uh, reinforcement uh, into them. Uh, in the UK, Andy Haldane, Mervyn King and I have been described as the ayatollahs of higher equity capital standards. We are seen as sort of lunatic extremists out there on the edge. But I have to say that this afternoon, Annette Admati and Simon Johnson issued fatwas on the subject, <laughs> which made the three of us back there in the UK sound like wishy-washy liberals. <laughs> now, as it happens, I very much agree with Annette and, and Simon. I think uh, the absolute core of the regulatory response to this financial crisis should be higher capital, and in particular, higher uh, equity capital standards. And I think there has been a deep, as Anat set out, a deep intellectual confusion, and as Simon said, a cognitive capture on this subject which is very profound and very worrying. And I think in an ideal world, we would in fact impose still higher standards than we have in Basel III. But I do also want, uh, in making a few comments on this subject, to strongly endorse uh, what Claudio Borio said, which is that even if Basel III is not the absolute ideal, it is still a major step forward and a very big increase in capital requirements. And I don't think I'm saying that solely because I have devoted about uh, two years of my life 
to meeting in windowless rooms uh, throughout the world uh, debating that precise subject. So I admit I'm biased. I sort of have to believe uh, that we've been successful because otherwise I've wasted a lot of my life. But I do think it is very important in these debates, not just about this particular issue, but also about economics in general, to balance continually being theoretically clear about what the ideal first best solution is, but also about what is practical and doable in the real world. We must not make the best the enemy of the good. And I think Basel III is a far better bank capital and liquidity regime than we could have hoped to get to two or three years ago, and far better than that which led us into uh, this crisis. So I did want to say that in response to that debate this afternoon. But actually, I'm not going to talk about financial stability in great detail uh, this evening. As I say, I'm going to take a, a wider uh, point of view. And I'm going to comment upon uh, the whole range of the subjects that we've been discussing today and tomorrow. Now, of course, these discussions today and tomorrow uh, are within the context of a conference which has been organized by Rob Johnson. And as a result, uh, we are devoted to extremely long days. Um, <laughs> we started this morning at 8 a.m. And tomorrow morning, there is a session on complexity which starts at 7 a.m. <laughs> now, there will be a break between my speech and that session, but it's going to be only a brief one. <laughs> now... Like, like many of us, of course, uh, Rob is a great admirer of John Maynard Keynes. But I have to say that one of the elements of Keynes's thinking and general philosophy of life, which simply seems to entirely have escaped Rob's notice, <laughs> is the clear importance which Keynes attached to leisure. <laughs> and to using the fruits of productivity to increase the devotion of time to leisure. In Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, Keynes foresaw very favorably a world in which we would have become so productive that only a small fraction of our working week would be devoted to work. And I am reasonably confident that Keynes intended that that favorable outlook applied not only to normal human beings, but also to economists. <laughs> so before the next INET conference, I'm going to send a reminder copy of Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren to Rob. <laughs> and I'm sure... <laughs> and I'm sure that next time round, the Sunday session will start at a decadently late hour of 7.30. <laughs> now, but while it's been a very long day, it's also been a very varied one. It's also been one in which I've learned some new terminology. I had not realized that we had something which was formerly known as new, new trade theory. <laughs> this raises all sorts of possibilities. We have neo-Keynesian theory. Why don't we have neo-neo-Keynesian theory? <laughs> Perhaps we could have new neo-neo-Keynesian theory or even new new neo-Keynesian -neo theory. The possibilities are endless. But it has been a varied day. And in the course of today and tomorrow, we will have discussed macroeconomics, global governance, financial stability, environmental sustainability, and issues of global equity. And that reflects that while the immediate drive for INET's creation was the financial crash and the belief that poor, inadequate economic science had driven failures of financial regulation, the belief that INET must also foster beyond that a wider questioning of the conventional wisdoms which have dominated much of public policy for the last 30 years or so and which seemed to derive either from dominant trends in economic science itself 
or from the way in which the believed insights of economic science have been translated into the ideologies and beliefs of what Keynes called practical men. And I certainly believe that that wide challenge to conventional wisdom uh, is essential because while there undoubtedly were many failures of economic theory and public policy which were specific to the issues of the financial system itself, I think those failures existed within and were nurtured by a wider dominant consensus. A conventional wisdom of political economy as much as of technical economics, though paradoxically a political economy, one of whose tenets was to deny the feasibility or indeed the importance of political choice. I think that conventional wisdom, which has tended to dominate the last 30 years, has had three key tenets. First, that we know what the key objective of economic policy and indeed of wider public policy is, and it is economic growth, rising prosperity, increasing GDP or GDP per capita. It's the economy stupid, vote for me, and I'll help the economy grow more rapidly. Secondly, that we know the means by which growth will be maximized, and that that means is essentially market liberalization. Deregulation as the route to economic efficiency in pretty much all product and service markets, free trade and free capital flows as the crucial drivers of economic development and economic catch-up, and financial market liberalization and increased financial intensity as the route to efficient dispersion of risk and efficient allocation of capital. And third and finally, that inequality, and indeed rising inequality, can be justified because it creates incentives which make markets efficient, which in turn generates growth, which in turn generates human well-being. And indeed that inequality doesn't matter much as long as prosperity is rising, so that absolute income is important to human well-being, but concerns about relative income are the product of uh, what Marty Feldstein described uh, in his uh, uh, presidential debate at the AEA uh, as, I think it was, unattractive uh, envy. These three propositions have formed, I think, an internally consistent and uh, self-reinforcing belief system. A belief system which then can and has been used to challenge the possibility of political choice whether that political choice is about the trade-offs between growth and environmental uh, responsibility or trade-offs and choices about income distribution. The absence of choice, there is no alternative, as Maggie Thatcher put it. And I suspect if you polled non-economists, we would find many who believe that those tenets derive directly from economics that the dismal science is all about telling us how constrained our public choices are. And instead, I believe, new economic thinking has to restore a recognition of economics as a tool for elucidating political choices. And to do that, it has to challenge assumptions about objectives as well as means, and question in particular all three of the dominant tenets of the last 30 years. On the objectives of economic science and economic activity, I think the crucial question, which I do not think we can simply ignore, is how important is economic growth as measured by national income accounts? How important is it to human welfare? Which was an issue which uh, Jean-Paul uh, Fitoussi put clearly on the table in Friday afternoon's session. And of course, it's clearly the case that many economists would deny that economists have ever said that maximizing growth is the objective of economic policy. But I think it's also very clear that the practical men and women who populate finance departments and industry and commerce departments think that economics says that growth should be the objective and that that belief has real implications for public policy 
and for the constraints that are perceived to exist. For instance, on climate change, Nick Stern estimated that we can dramatically cut emissions at a growth penalty of only 1 or 2 percent. But suppose that further analysis suggests a much higher figure than that, 5 or 10 percent. Should we, we, we be willing to make that sacrifice? Is it indeed, in welfare terms, a sacrifice at all? Does economic growth deliver increased welfare or well-being or self-perceived happiness or whatever the objective is? It's actually a very important issue which we can't avoid. So it's an important issue, but it's also deeply contested. The work of Richard Easterling, Bruno Frey, Richard Layard suggested a very clear answer to that question, which is that increasing prosperity, measured however imperfectly by standard GDP per capita measures, matters a lot to human happiness or well-being as we go from the per capita income of, say, Africa today to that of the developed world in the 1950s or 60s, say 20,000 or so dollars per capita, but that once you've reached that level, further growth delivers no further benefit. But those findings have in turn been challenged by researchers such as Justin Wolfers, who find that there is some correlation between self-perceived measures of well-being and increasing GDP at all levels of income. Now, my own conclusions, having looked very carefully at both of these sets of arguments, is that while Wolfer's analysis casts doubts about the strength of some of Easterlin's or Frey's conclusions, his own data is still compatible with the conclusion that once you reach high levels of income, the relationship between further growth and further welfare enhancement is uncertain and complex so that perhaps economic growth is capable of producing increases in human welfare, but absolutely not certain to do so. And there are certainly many good reasons, many good theoretical reasons, which uh, illustrate, which lead us to doubt whether further economic growth will relentlessly make us more content. More content. There is the straightforward process of satiation and declining marginal utility given a hierarchy of human needs. One winter coat keeps you warm. The second winter coat gives you the second order buzz of fashion and amenity. There is the way in which increasing prosperity through congestion and externality effects can degrade the very amenity we are all better able to afford. The richer we all are, the more that we can visit beaches or skiing pistes, but the more that those are crowded so that the whole amenity degrades. There is the increasing importance, once basic human needs are met, of competition for relative status, to which actually rich people devote really quite a large element of their total income in the consumption of premium branded goods and fashion items. And there is the increasing importance of limited supply positional goods, above all housing, in the most pleasant locations. So that even individuals who individually are capable of being free from this relative status competition still have to win in the competition for relative income in order to achieve absolute income. In order to afford the house in the nice part of town, you don't have to get richer, you have to get richer relative to how rich everybody else is. Now all these factors combined with the empirical evidence suggest, I believe, that we cannot simply assume that increasing measured prosperity will deliver increased well-being, even if it might do so under some circumstances. And I think we also have to recognize, as uh, Jean-Paul Fitoussi said yesterday afternoon, and as Duncan Foley discussed this afternoon, how amazingly arbitrary are the national accounting conventions which result in GDP measures. The more I have tried to think about the value added of the wholesale financial sector, for instance, the less certain I am about what, if anything, GDP measures of value added from that sector are actually telling us. And what is quite interesting in the history of economic thought is that foresightful economists were warning 75 years ago to be careful about attaching too much importance 
to GDP measures. Lionel Robbins, writing in the mid-1930s, which was when national accounting conventions were being developed, argued strongly that the measures of aggregate social income, as he called it, only had meaning and usefulness in relation to monetary policy and stabilization policies, that they were adequate for dealing with such issues, stabilization or monetary policy, because even if the measures were based on arbitrary conventions, they could still deliver useful information short term, year by year, because over that period of time, all that matters is that the conventions are stable. But that, as Robbins put it, in relation to the end objectives of economic activity, and I quote, the addition of prices or individual incomes to form social aggregates is an operation with very little meaning. Now, actually, most of us who did undergraduate economics learnt that in undergraduate economics. Most of us go through a process of reminding ourselves how arbitrary GDP measures are. But we often seen, when we then get to the process of public policy formulation, to forget that. But I think economics cannot ignore the issue of what the ultimate end objectives are. It cannot simply assume what the objectives are because the answers have real implications for policy. Now, this is an area which is uncomfortable for those who like nice, clear mathematical maximans because it's an area that takes us into philosophical issues. Is happiness actually the objective? Is happiness the same as well-being? If 99.999% of the population was extremely happy because we were sort of human sacrificing the one person, uh, would that be okay? Where do measures and issues such as justice or ethics enter the picture? All the problems that the philosophers of utilitarianism posed but never fully and effectively uh, resolved. And this whole area of contentment, well-being, happiness involves economists in the use of measurement mechanisms such as surveys of self-perceived contentment which are clearly quite as imperfect and fraught with methodological difficulty as any GDP measures. And for that reason, I'm extremely doubtful that our aim should be to replace GDP with some magic new measure, gross national well-being or gross national happiness, and then declare that the maximum that we're going to go for. But the absence of a perfect alternative should not make us content with what we've got. Economics must elucidate questions about end objectives, not assume that uh, we know something is the objective simply because it makes the modeling easy. But let's suppose that even if growth is not the overriding objective, that it is still desirable and particularly important for countries still at low or middle income levels. And I think that is very important to say. All this debate about happiness and contentment is fundamentally a debate about the rich developed world and about income growth from present levels. It's not about whether growth is valuable for people living on $1,000 a year in Africa. Actually, I, I said that in a lecture recently, and I said by mistake $1,000 a day in Africa. <laughs> And then I had to say that that simply proved that I spend too much of my time with bankers. Um, um, but what do we know about means? If the objective is still uh, valuable, what do we know about means? The objective of growth is still valuable. What do we know about means? Do, do freer markets, deregulation and liberalization, free trade and free capital flows, as the conventional wisdom has attended to assert, maximize economic growth potential? Well, I think we know from economic history that the only examples of fully planned economies have been failures and that they have failed to achieve either sustained growth in itself or indeed environmentally sustainable growth, a, a point which Larry uh, alluded to last, week, last night, with initial growth spurts atrophying into inefficiency and corruption. Hayek's insight about the impossibility of replicating the effectiveness of a price system proved right in a giant and uh, rather unfortunate empirical test. 
But beyond that economic history of the inadequacy of fully planned systems, actually economic history does not support the contention of theory that there is one best model of economic growth. And that is one crucial reason why, as discussed yesterday and again today, we need to restore economic history to the university economics curriculum. As Hajun Chang points out in the book we all received a copy of yesterday, and I'm sure he may mention it in tomorrow's session, thing seven of the 23 things they don't tell you about capitalism is that actually very few countries in the early stages of successful economic development and economic takeoff or economic catch-up achieved growth through the classic liberal combination of totally free markets, limited state intervention, free trade, and free capital flows. Indeed, there really is, in economic history, only one example which achieved economic takeoff through the classically described mix, and that is Britain in the 19th century. Elsewhere in the historic record, you will find tariffs, state industrial sponsorship, capital constraints, financial repression in varying degrees and mixes. And as for the rich developed economies, seeking from positions of already attained prosperity to grow further, it is simply not empirically clear that the record of the last 30 years of deregulation and freer markets, and in particular freer and more active financial markets, has been superior to that achieved in the 30 post-war years of more regulated markets and more repressed finance. Now, I think there is still a strong case in favor of several of the deregulations of the 80s and 90s. In particular, say, let's take telecoms deregulation. But I think it's a case which need to be made by reference to the specific beneficial impacts in specific markets, not by reference to some generalized theory that we know in advance that market completion and market liberalization will everywhere take us closer to the sort of arrow de Bre nirvana of general equilibrium. And I think the starting point of good economics is to recognize how different different markets are. There's a wonderful phrase which Paul Krugman has uh, created out of a, uh, a variant on Tolstoy's line. Many of you may know that uh, Tolstoy's opening line of Anna Karenin is all happy families are happy in the same way all unhappy families are unhappy in their own particular way. And Paul has suggested the variant that all perfect markets are perfect in exactly the same way and all imperfect markets are imperfect in their own particular way. All markets are indeed imperfect, but the degree to which they're imperfect varies hugely. And some markets, frankly, although they're imperfect, are close enough to our model of perfect economics that actually the only sensible policy is to let free competition rip. If we want to have good restaurants, which offer variety, good service, attractive ambience, we know no better way than to allow entrepreneurial activity to flourish. A thousand flowers will bloom, some will bloom, some will fail, and we'll end up with better restaurants. And anybody who doesn't believe that didn't visit a restaurant in the Soviet bloc before the fall <laughs> of the wall. But some other markets, and in particular financial markets, which link the present to the future under conditions of inherent irreducible uncertainty, work pretty badly when left entirely to themselves. They have strong tendencies towards financial instability and to the proliferation of purely distributive rather than creative activities rent extracting rather than value added activities, though I suspect with the imperfections of our GDP measures, some of these rent extracting activities entering as an apparent addition to GDP. And as uh, Anat Admati said today, that suggests that that rent extraction may have produced a non-trivial misallocation of skilled resources to some things which are not very creative in a social value added sense. So I think even if we were convinced that increased economic value added was the appropriate objective, it's very unclear that ever freer and more complete financial markets is an effective means to achieve that. Finally, 
within this holy trinity of the conventional wisdom, what about issues of income distribution and of inequality? Well, as stressed by several speakers in the first session and then referred to again by uh, Dalia Marin this afternoon, inequality in developed countries, but also within several developing countries, has increased quite dramatically in the last few decades, both as between the bottom of the income distribution and the median, but even more dramatically between the median and the top, and indeed between the top 1% and the poor old rest of the only moderately well-off rest of the top decile, and indeed between the top 0.1% and the poor old, only quite rich rest of the top percentile, and indeed as between George and just the top 0.1%. <laughs> and the predominant response to all of this, the predominant response of this between the conventional wisdom is that we don't need to do anything about it, for instance, by progressive income redistribution, because low-income taxes produce necessary incentives to hard work, innovation, and creativity, which then produces growth, which then produces human contentment. Vote for low taxes for the rich, because it will increase the size of the economic cake available for all. And also, the assertion is that it doesn't matter as long as average income is increasing, because what matters is absolute income rather than relative income. Now, what should we think of these assertions? Well, it's completely obvious that incentives obviously matter to a degree. It's transparently obvious that if tax rates were 100%, people wouldn't work, and therefore tax rates shouldn't be 100%. But beyond that, what do we actually really know in economic science about this debate about incentives. Well, the interesting thing is that most of the analysis focuses on incentives at the middle and bottom end of the income distribution. It asks questions about whether when we vary tax rates, people enter or leave the workforce, or whether they work more or less hours. And that's clearly an important and interesting issue, but it's pretty much entirely irrelevant to the issue of incentives at high income, top managerial levels. And actually, there's very little analysis which throws any light on the issue of how levels of pay or taxes affect the work ethic or the effectiveness of top earners. And that's because it's actually an incredibly difficult thing uh, to research. So that, in fact, any belief that increased incentives are powerful at the top end of the income distribution is largely an assertion of belief, not an empirical observation, and a belief which we could certainly question. Empirically, I think it is simply unclear that top executives worked less or less effectively in the higher taxed and lower paid 1950s and 60s before the explosion of top banker pay or the top CEO pay, which Dalia Marin illustrated this afternoon, or the reductions in high marginal tax rates. And even if that war for talent, which was referred to this afternoon, has been accompanied by a more ferocious devotion to the short-term competitive success of individual firms, I think the extent to which that has actually driven superior economic growth is again unclear. And equally, theoretically, if the motivation set of high income earners is, as I believe, heavily driven not by absolute income, but by relative income and status competition with everybody else, then higher marginal tax rates, which reduce absolute income, which, but which leave relative income distribution unchanged, should not be expected to make all that much difference to how hard or how effectively top earners work. So, of course, there are sensible limits to the progressivity of tax rates, but I suspect they are essentially political and social limits, not, in technical terms, economic limits. They are related to notions of what is a fair distribution between private benefit and social contribution. They are related to the tax rates which different people would consider justify avoidance and evasion. 
activity. They are, devoted, they are related to issues of the personal acceptance of whether a tax rate is legitimate, rather than having much to do with implications for incentives that might deliver superior growth. As for whether inequality matters, well, clearly it does if the increase in inequality is so great as to deny the median or the bottom of the distribution any share in rising prosperity. And that indeed is part of what has happened, at least in the US, over the last 20 years. But I think we also have to take seriously the argument that the degree of relative income dispersion may matter even if all income deciles are enjoying some increased income growth. Whether it matters quite as much as Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson argue in the spirit level, I think can and uh, should be debated. But I think their evidence does make a strong case that inequality matters to a degree and that there is a degree of income dispersion which directly undermines the self-esteem and therefore well-being of the relative losers in society and which undermines the sense of social cohesion and trust which are crucial to effective societies and well-being. So I don't think we can avoid questions about the drivers of increasing inequality or what, if anything, we can do about it. But I think it's important for us to recognize that in dealing with those issues, we have to go beyond some of our standard analytical assumptions, such as the assumption that individual utility preference schedules can be assumed to be independent givens, independent of everybody else's uh, schedule. So to sum up, beyond some level of income growth, income growth prob of income, further income growth probably becomes less important and less necessarily conducive to increased human well-being. Freer markets don't always deliver faster growth and increased economic efficiency, and the degree of inequality which has developed may be unnecessary to achieve growth and may impose welfare costs not offset by any level of absolute income growth. So both in respect to objectives and means, I think the dominant economic belief system has been deeply flawed. I think those flaws in part reflect not academic economics itself, but the translation of ideas into ideology, the influence of economic interests as well as ideas, and the simplifications necessarily made by practical men and women when they turn ideas into policy prescriptions. But I think it is also fair to say that those flaws also reflect biases within the dominant strain of academic e economics, a tendency to shy away from questions about end objectives, about human nature, about the historic empirical record, and to build mathematical models on the basis of assumptions which make the models tractable. But if the three tenets that I've set out are flawed, what follows for policy? If growth is not as important, not so important for rich economies, rich economies, if freer markets don't always deliver superior growth, and if inequality matters, do we then have to embrace a sort of radical green egalitarianism? Anti-growth, because growth isn't important, against markets, because they don't necessarily produce growth or don't produce maximum growth, and, they don't, and that they produce inequality. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint radical green egalitarianisms, egalitarians, because I think there is a case for growth, for markets, and for some non-trivial resulting inequality, but I think it's a quite different one and an older and more political one than that put forward by the instrumental conventional wisdom of the last 30 years. First on growth, further increases in average income may not, as the economists of happiness tell us, have the potential to increase contentment in already rich societies. But the possibility of growth and the actuality of growth and the process of growth may be vitally important to the contentment of people in the modern world. And let me try to explain why that is not word spinning. The expectation of technological progress, of innovation, of changing styles and fashions may be important to my sense of well-being 
even once those expectations are satisfied, no permanent increase in happiness is likely to result. Given that I know that the electronic gadgetry that I own today has not made me personally happier than I was 20 years ago, it is unlikely that further generations of that product are going to make me permanently happier in future. But I would be unhappy if the economy became static, if products and services didn't, in some sense, get better or simply change, simply change year by year. It is the journey that matters, not the destination. Now, that, of course, is a culturally relative statement, for it may be that there can exist societies in which people are happy with a permanently unchanging lifestyle. Bhutan scores very high on these happiness indices. But while it's culturally relative, this is not, I think, a mindset from which modern men and women in modern societies have any capacity to escape. For I think the great transformation of the last two centuries, the transformation of the Industrial Revolution of the modern world, which took us from a relatively static and unchanging economy to a continually changing economy, rested on and in itself generated institutions and cultural assumptions which commit us to perpetual change. Now, Gordon Brown quoted Tennyson's great poem, Ulysses, earlier this afternoon. He quoted its final line, to strive to seek to find and not to yield. Earlier in the poem, Tennyson says, yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever as I move. Now, on balance, I think it is likely that Tennyson did not have precisely in mind the way in which an ex-ante upward sloping marginal utility schedule <laughs> might flatten ex-post as aspiration adjusts uh, to uh, reflect uh, a income levels already achieved. But his poem was, I think, reflective of a Victorian sense of progress, of life as a continual striving after new frontiers, whether in geography or technology. That is the culture of the modern world created by the Industrial Revolution, and I don't think we're going to put that genie back in the bottle, nor would I want to. Rather, we have to manage its consequences. So the process of growth may be important, even if the end result is not. But also, reasonably free markets and personal economic freedom may be important to human well-being, even if further growth is not, in essence, more important. And that is first because, without reasonably free markets and free price systems and personal incentives, economies may not only fail to maximize further growth, they may actually regress and atrophy the Soviet Union in its final decades. But second, and more fundamentally, because there is an argument for market freedoms which exists quite independent of allocative efficiency benefits. As Amartya Sen puts it, I quote, the merit of the market does not lie only in the capacity to generate more efficient culmination outcomes, but in the, pro by, in the processes by which those outcomes are achieved. Suppose Amartya Sen asks that contrary to Hayek's propositions, a centralized Soviet economy of directed labor and administered prices had been as effective as the market economies at delivering GDP growth, would that have been a desirable outcome? The answer is surely no, because as Sen puts it, the freedom of people to act as they like in deciding where to work, what to consume, and what to produce is in and of itself an important element of freedom, quite independent of any allocative efficiency benefits. So a crucial justification for economic freedom therefore exists independent of allocative efficiency benefits and is still valid even if developed countries have reached a point where further growth in GDP has limited and uncertain potential to deliver permanent increases in human well-being. And that economic freedom is likely in turn to generate a reasonable level of economic growth, which perhaps in rich societies we should think about as the acceptable byproduct of other desirable aims rather than the objective in itself. 
Finally, inequality. Well, if we have reasonable economic freedom to innovate, to set up new businesses, to compete, to take one's labor elsewhere, you will have non-trivial inequality. And so there does exist a political and philosophical justification for inequality, which has really very little to do with the incentive benefits uh, which drive economic growth, and which is more fundamental, deriving from people's right to keep a significant share of their income they earn in free exchange with others. And there is also an argument rooted in a realistic assessment of human nature, which says that if you don't allow talented, energetic, driven people to compete in markets and keep a significant share of their gains, they will compete in other more destructive ways. As Keynes indeed put it in the general theory, one of the benefits of the market and of non-trivial inequality is that, and I quote, dangerous human proclivities can be canalized into comparatively harmless channels by the existence of opportunities for money making and private wealth, which if they cannot be satisfied in this way, may find their outlet in cruelty, the reckless pursuit of personal power and authority and other forms of self-aggrandizement. It is better that man should tyrannize over his bank balance than over his fellow citizens. Now that may seem that may seem a very negative justification for markets and resulting inequality. But I suspect it may be a powerful, more powerful one than can the conventional assertion that inequality drives better incentives, which drives growth, which necessarily delivers human well-being. Now, such arguments for markets, for economic freedom, and for some resulting inequality take us back to a more political economics, to political economy to the discipline of political economy which existed before the mathematization of the neoclassicists. As John Hicks, himself of course a key figure in that mathematization, himself recognized, and I quote, the liberal principles of the classical Smithian and Ricardian economists were not in the first phase economic principles. They were an application to economics of principles which were thought to apply in a much wider field. The contention, the contention that economic freedom made for economic efficiency was no more than a secondary support. So rejecting the conventional wisdom of growth, markets and inequality still leaves in place a powerful liberal case for economic freedom and for growth as the likely byproduct. But it is a very different justification than the conventional wisdom and I think that very different implications can policy, follow for policy in many areas. So to end this evening, let me just suggest three different implications of that different way of thinking about why markets and economic freedom are justified. First, stability and stabilization matters an awful lot. The same evidence on well-being and happiness that casts doubt about whether long-term growth maximization is all that important, says that recessions and debt crises are very bad for human welfare because even if higher income doesn't make people permanently happier, they deeply dislike setbacks to income and wealth already achieved and because involuntary unemployment is very, very bad for human welfare. So, Recovery of GDP from its current recession level matters an awful lot, even if achieving 2.1% versus 2.0% on average over the next 30 years really doesn't matter much at all. And avoiding recessions in the first place is even more important. Now this, as John Cassidy pointed out to me in the middle of the afternoon, is a pretty much complete inversion of Lucas's proposition in his AEA presidential address, which was that we had fixed and solved the problems of stabilization and that what now matters is the challenge of maximizing growth. And that conclusion that stability is hugely important is very relevant to a specific debate uh, of great concern to me, the debate about optimal bank capital ratios and the regulation of financial innovation. Some analyses do suggest 
that much higher equity standards might marginally reduce medium-term growth. And the financial industry certainly argues that financial derivatives somehow secure some marginal allocative efficiency benefits. Now, I have to say that I have some doubts about whether either of these assertions is actually true. But let us suppose for now that they are. They would still not be clincher arguments against high capital standards or trading book capital requirements which restricted derivative market liquidity. Because the optimal welfare maximization solution might well be to favor policies which reduce the potential volatility of GDP growth, even if they involve some marginal reduction in the long-term average growth rate. Second implication, which is on optimal climate change policy, and I've mentioned it before. If increasing GDP per capita has an uncertain feed-through to increasing human well-being, then action to offset the harmful effects of climate change could be welfare optimal, even if the cost to GDP were significantly higher than Nick Stern's estimate of 1% to 2%. Third and finally, plans to lean against increasing inequality. There are certainly limits on our ability to do so. There are avoidance and evasion dangers, or there are international competition effects. But they are, I suggest, almost certainly less severe than has typically been asserted. There is a choice to be made. My general, point, my general point, indeed, is that good economics leaves us with far wider degrees of freedom to make political and social choices than has frequently been asserted. And that the role of good economics is to inform those choices, not to deny their possibility. Lionel Robbins, like Hicks, was in many ways a practitioner of technically precise economics, and he was wary of the philosophical tendency within Keynes's thought. And indeed, when Keynes argued that, quote, economics is essentially a moral science, he actually started that sentence with, as against Robbins, economics is essentially a moral science. But Lionel Robbins himself wrote, there is nothing in economics which relieves us of the obligation to choose. And that, I think, is a pretty good guiding principle for new economic thinking. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have some time for some questions. And uh, we can bring the uh, couple of chairs up. Uh, I want to uh, tell you that after two nights, I, I personally am really beginning to enjoy these dinners. Last night, over the course of two lectures, I learned that John Maynard Keynes avoided American baseball because he didn't want to affiliate with a communist. Yep. And uh, tonight, I learned many things, first of which is that Keynes never worked for Soros Fund Management. <laughs> Secondly, uh, in defending myself, I have to say that uh, Keynes and Harry Dexter White had three weeks to work on their team, <laughs> and I only have two and a half days. <laughs> but so at that juncture, I was very tempted, because of the fabulous oratory contributions that you make, to create something like the Lord Adair Turner Perpetual Hour of Leisure at each day of the <laughs> INET conference. But, 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 there, but there was a problem. And that is, uh, I started listening to you talk about happiness. And you have to realize that this year you spoke one hour earlier than you did last year, and you still beat me up. <laughs> and so I looked at that and I thought, Maybe we should create something like the Lord Adair Turner 15 minutes of leisure next year, and then you could beat me up a little more because it's the journey that matters. And then you might be happier with that than if I just grant you the leisure that you requested. So you've thoroughly confused me, and now let's move to the questions of the audience. Duncan? Well, I. I appreciated the talk very much, and I, I hope that INET will return to these 
I mean, it was a very rich talk. I mean, you covered a huge territory, and, and I hope that INET returns to many of the themes that you uh, mentioned um, continually. But let me, let me just ask you, at, at this point, I tend to come out of your talk saying, well, the job of the advanced countries is to improve welfare by re redistribution without growth. And the job of the uh, less wealthy countries is to try to raise their productivity and uh, through uh, more conventional growth methods, if possible, without um, uh, worsening distribution enormously. Um, is there anything, I mean, maybe that's the green, you, you teased what was, what was your phrase, green? Uh, radical green egalitarianism. Radical green <laughs> egalitarianism. Well, I don't know if that's radical green e egalitarianism, but I'd like your comment. What's, what's wrong with that general strategy? Rich countries are rich enough. We need to improve welfare by redistribution, and poor countries need to grow. Well, I think poor countries need to grow. I think that's absolutely right, and we need to find ways for poor countries to grow in a way which is uh, environmentally sustainable, but I think that is, uh, that is doable. I'm an optimist on that. <clears throat> I think for rich countries, I mean, what I was trying to suggest is, you know, it is an intermediate point of view. I do think uh, there is a case for economic freedom which doesn't disappear. I think we will continue to grow in, in measured terms. I think we have to make that growth more environmentally sustainable. I attach relatively little importance to whether that growth is 1.9% or, or, or 2%. But on your issue of, of, of redistribution, I guess all I'm saying is, uh, you know, we need to have that on the agenda. I do think it is very odd, frankly, that in a period of time for the last 30 years where for a set of reasons which I think are inherent and fundamental, the pre-tax inequality of income distribution has been increasing. And in my Lionel Robbins lectures, I set out a set of an attempt to understand what the features of doing that is, that rather than leaning against that wind, we've deliberately picked up a, you know, a, a can of petrol and, and made it even more extreme by, by chucking petrol on the, 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 uh, uh, on the fire. Now, I think that actually has a lot to do with uh, political processes. I think the very process of increasing income inequality, particularly in America with its uh, campaign distribution system, can also uh, create uh, the political mechanisms which then make it even more extreme by unwinding the degree of progressivity in the tax system. There's a, there's a sort of circularity in the tax rate in the political system. And I would, I would lean somewhat against that. But uh, the issue then is, how far do you lean against that? But I don't think there's anything wrong with growth in rich, developed countries. As I say, I really do believe, you know, the journey matters, not the destination. That is, uh, that is uh, uh, it is an attractive thing that we continue to innovate, we continue to change. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, you, you have an element of truth that in rich, developed societies, we should attach more importance to what is the pattern of growth and the pattern of the distribution of growth, which is likely to increase welfare, and less to the maximization of growth per se. And within that, it's just a matter of degree. I'm going to make uh, Martin Wolf. I'm going to make a, uh, a provocative uh, remark. I did that yesterday with uh, Larry. Um, it seems to me that a critic of you of yours could argue that you have one very powerful similarity with the economists you criticise, which is you, yours is a speech of a platonic guardian. Your, this is the speech of somebody yep. for whom politics is a purely notional concept. And really, it's about what you think, on the basis of your profound analysis, society should look like, not on rooted in any political processes. So I would, I could go further, but I'd just like to see how you would, the word democracy, I think, did not appear once in this speech. 
the, the word political parties and political conflict did not appear once in this speech. Uh, so the question I would like to know is how you see this very grand platonic vision of the world actually relating to process of political choice in free dem democratic societies? Well, Martin, it's always possible to point out the words that didn't occur in a speech. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't mention, I didn't mention nuclear war, I didn't mention <laughs> Afghanistan. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of things which are pretty important in the world which I didn't mention. So, uh, uh, but, but, no, but I take the point. I take, I take, I take the point. I I, but I take the point. I take the point. Uh, do, do I think that policy either will ever or should be driven by a sort of platonic class saying, you know, this is, uh, this is the way it should? No, not in the least. Things are driven by politics, uh, uh, political processes, d democracy is, as Churchill said, the best system of, you know, uh, 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 it's the worst system apart from anything, anything else which has existed, but therefore it's the best system possible. And I think the role of economists or public policy thinkers is just to try to be clear. It's and one of the most crucial things we can do is to avoid introducing into the debate false statements. So that within the debate, for instance, about the degree of inequality, and let me be absolutely clear, I'm not an egalitarian. Um, I have a certain self-interest in not being an egalitarian, apart from anything else. Um, but in that debate, I think it is just, if you hear an idea being introduced which you believe to be false, which is that increasing inequality is through the incentive process going to make everybody else richer, I think there is a legitimate public role of saying, no, that's, that strikes me as a false idea. Uh, that's something which is not useful uh, to the debate. Now, actually, the degree, and it responds to Duncan's point about, uh, you know, degree of egalitarianism, the degree of distribution, that would be determined by a political process. And all I'm trying to do is remove from that debate false ideas or false assertions. I'd also say that my general philosophy of change, whether it be in relation to climate change, whether it be in the avoidance of future, future nuclear war, in the process of making society somewhat better, is that all you're ever doing is trying your little best to tip the balance slightly in the direction of what you think is slightly more favorable. But that's still a worthwhile thing to do. So that is how I would defend myself against this uh, assertion of uh, platonic dictatorship. <laughs> right over here. Hello there. Uh, Richard Bronk, London School of Economics. I very much enjoyed that talk. And it struck me that much of what you were actually arguing for was for going back to an older conception of happiness, a more Aristotelian conception of, of happiness as self-development, um, self-creation, opportunities, or perhaps mill as well, experiments for living, and that this is what markets can give us, as well as, as, as growth, is the opportunity for self-creation, for self-development, and so on. And uh, just to pick up Martin Wolf's point, um, I, I think you uh, have um, not done yourself um, credit in your, for your answer just now, it seems to me you made quite clear in your speech that actually political choice was what you were looking for, that values have to be made explicit yeah. by economists. And yeah, thank you, thank you, Martin, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to have an ally who... Uh, uh, I mean, y your point about what is, uh, I'm saying, is the good life, I'm not sure, uh, this whole issue of what is the good life, what is happiness, what is well-being, uh, I know that we've actually got to wait for a book by Robert Skidelsky later this year, which I think is called, Robert, what is it called? It's called How Much is Enough, is it, or something like that, um, where, where Robert is precisely addressing these issues, which, of course, Keynes uh, addressed at considerable length. I think all that I've got to uh, on that debate about what is the end objective is the realization that if you think the objective is the maximization of GDP per capita, that is a very, very odd objective to set. Uh, beyond that, I do not pretend that I have thought out to the extent that I hope Robert will set out uh, any alternative uh, definition of what a sensible objective uh, is. Uh, but I think Robert did tell me two months ago that it is the Aristotelian vision, so I do tend to agree with that. Uh, Axel?
I would like to take up Martin Wolf's uh, point from a diff somewhat different standpoint. Uh, because you started your talk about talking about the sort of dominant doctrine uh, preached in economics for the last 20 years, and you were critical of it. And uh, there's one aspect that you didn't touch upon, which was uh, that it had quite an anti-democratic yeah. uh, uh, yeah. uh, point to it. Yeah. Uh, and that much of the policy prescriptions that we got out of that was ways of constraining democratic yeah. Yeah. governments not so that they wouldn't do what the electorate or, or their imperfectly elected uh, representatives would do. And uh, uh, I, I hope I'm not rude in pointing out that it's that doctrine uh, that has uh, blessed the central banks with independence. Well, um, since I'm not an inter central banker, um, I can take this rudeness. Um, I think... I, Actually, though, I think I'd, um, uh, I'd defend central bank independence. I mean, I, I think there is, you're, you're absolutely right, there are issues as to what are the issues which should be subject to political debate. And the more I think about it, both of the contributions are giving me yet, yet better arguments to argue against uh, Martin's attack. You know, because I think I was actually saying <clears throat> that political choice is, is, is fundamental that there are a whole load of issues where the fundamental thing that e economics should not be saying to people is that you have no choices. There are wide degrees of choice and they need to be debated. Um, I think though you then have within that, are there some things where we have enough confidence that it's highly likely that we know the optimal result that we are wise to give it to independent technocrats and let them run it. And I actually do think that a reasonable degree of price stability is one of those things. And that whereas you could say, well, that's a denial of choice because the choice between higher level of inflation, a uh, you know, temporarily higher growth rate or employment rate is a political choice. Um, I do think that uh, the operation of that uh, through the political system uh, was not a very successful one. The fact is that before the UK had independence of the Bank of England, we routin routinely have, used to have uh, interest rate cuts would occur on the Monday morning of the party conference of the party then in power. And that was not terribly good economic policy. And I don't think that was part of a sensible public debate uh, about the choices that were made. I think that was part of the manipulation of public opinion by, uh, the, uh, uh, by the governing party. So I, I think actually I, I, I disagree with you on that particular instance. I think I, I am a supporter of central bank independence within the definition of what the objective is. I mean, so maybe I've got a British bias there. I, I believe in inflation targets set by Parliament and technocratic independent central bankers meeting them. I do not believe in central banks being able to define what price stability should mean. I think that's the step of independence which is too far. your independence arguments still go through. Well, you can add another uh, objective, and uh, there's always the issue of whether you should, and I, I'm not against that, but whatever it is, I think there is a value in defining the objective at the level of parliament and government, and then handing it over to the technocrats to deliver that. There is a, there is a benefit of a sort of self-denying ordinance of government of the control of the short-term interest rate. But, George? It's that Roman uh, uh, muttering in the corner oh. there, I think. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, you, fo you forgot to mention one of the most uh, powerful arguments in favor of the uh, prevailing or recently prevailing paradigm, namely that uh, gro growth 
can be measured, yeah. that it can be quantified. Yeah. And therefore, you know what's ahead, and when you are ahead, and when you are behind. Yeah. And that's a great merit. Yeah. Uh, and that goes a long way to explain why that paradigm has yeah. actually prevailed. Yeah. No, well, well, that is right. But, and as we know, all businesses flourish best with a defined maxima. And one of the things that makes uh, management of uh, private companies so much easier than management of public sector institutions is that you have a defined maxima of, of shareholder value, whereas in the public sector you have multiple objectives. But, and that is why it has been attractive. People, you know, they, they, uh, they, they, they head towards something which gives them a maxima to maximize. But if at the end of the day this thing, growth, isn't necessarily related uh, to, uh, to human welfare increase, then we've made life easier. It's obvious why we've migrated to that particular objective, but it's still not what we should do. I, I think one of the great challenges for subtle economic thinking, which understands the uncertainty as to what the objectives are and the means, is that it's going to be incredibly difficult for it to have the intellectual simplicity and the clarity of objectives of the previously existing dominant uh, conventional wisdom. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges for INET and new e economic thinking because it will always be the case that there will be a tendency for simple messages to crowd out complex messages. And I think the subtle message is a complex one. The la lady right over here. Uh, we'll I'm Anne after her, we'll do three more questions. Anne we'll Pesfor of uh, Prime Economics, but also co-author of the Green New Deal. Um, I want to say how much I welcomed your uh, insertion of sustainability into this uh, discussion this weekend, and I hope very much that INET will take it further. But I'm disturbed by this focus, this intense focus on growth, especially after Gordon Brown's speech this afternoon, because economists have an unnatural notion of growth. In nature, growth is not something that is linear and that is limitless. And, and in, in sort of in, inherent in your remarks is this notion that we can go on forever, and indeed in economics. And we can't. There are limits. There are ecolo ecological limits. On the other hand, my friends in the green movement are obsessed also with attacking notions of growth. And it just seems to me that this is a matter of language. What we will always have, as you pointed out, is the need for economic activity. So even if we are not extracting assets from the ecosystem at unsustainable levels, we will still need high levels of economic activity, high levels of employment. And I really just wish economists would get away from this very linear, upward, relentless, limitless notion of growth and start talking about how we maximize economic activity, which is sustainable and that invariably will require a certain amount of localization. But growth is, is the concept of it is, is implies limitlessness. It implies that there is never any stage of death, you know. <laughs> in nature, we go through periods of growth and death, but in economics, we don't. It just goes on forever. We've got to somehow deal with that. Well, I, I, I think I'm sort of agreeing with you because I, I think I was trying to dethrone, and, and the phrase I've used before is we've got to dethrone GDP per capita as, as the objective. My own belief is that even if you dethrone it, if you have reasonable economic freedom, people will innovate new things, they'll come up with new, more productive ways of doing that. That will excite people, interest people, it will satisfy our sense, as Keynes said, of caprice. Um, and that's, that's okay. And we've just got to make sure that we do that in a way which, in terms of in the environment, is sustainable. Now, I think if we appropriately price environmental externalities and appropriately reflect uh, some of those issues I've referred to about congestion externalities, etc., I think we will still end up with something which, in our arbitrary national income and accounting terms, uh, will show up as a, as a positive rate of growth. But we can... We can do that in a way 
which is less intensive uh, in its demands on the ecosystem, etc. It will be a, a different category of growth. And, and there, are there are many favorable trends in that. I mean, many of the things which now take the form of further growth are not actually terribly ecosystem uh, demanding, some of the things that in telecoms, in IT, uh, or indeed in you know, fashion or in uh, high quality restaurants. The, these are not, you know, things which are craft intensive, skill intensive, are not necessarily uh, asset and national resource intensive. I think what you're absolutely right is that, and it was mentioned here, I think, uh, I can't remember whether it was Larry who mentioned it last night or maybe Gordon, no, actually Gordon mentioned it at lunchtime. I think the issue of where jobs come from is a really fundamental thing because I think the creation of employment is a far more fundamental important thing uh, for human welfare than the measurement of economic growth per, per se. And I think it is quite striking uh, this disconnect between the things which we talk about to do with international competitive and high value added and the things that actually create you know, large numbers of jobs. Um, most of the things where we invest in science, invest in technology, and succeed in international competition will actually create very, very few jobs. Most of the jobs in our society are emerging from face-to-face -face services and things like that. Always remember that there are about 35,000 people employed by Microsoft and there are 1.2 million people employed by Walmart. So the idea that uh, IT creates jobs, I think, is a massively overstated one. Randy? Uh, Randy Ray, UMKC and Levy Institute. I thought this was a terrific talk. And the only place you left me was on the independence of the central banks. We, oh. we, we, well, that we, wasn't in the talk. We will not get into that. Um, uh, right now, when you're getting to job creation, I think you're, you're uh, absolutely on the right path. And it just seemed to me during your whole talk that what, what we need to replace um, this uh, impetus to GDP growth with is the UN Charter on Human Rights and the right to work in a job that is consistent with your education, training, and job experience is a fundamental right. And most of the other things that we think are important follow on from that. And so I think your answer to the last question actually is really getting to the point that I wanted to make, which is that job growth we know uh, does not follow on from GDP growth. And we need to really focus on creating jobs, good jobs um, that can support families throughout the globe as an alternative to GDP growth. I think I broadly agree with that, so I won't um, uh, respond to it. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, got uh, two more. Let's, uh, Eric in Anatole. Another uh, tour de force there, but uh, I want to tease out whether there's a little contradiction uh, in there. Uh, at the beginning, you, you uh, talked uh, exuberantly about the importance of, of happiness and uh, well-being, uh, and then talked about uh, the importance of, uh, of regulation in, in effectively restricting freedom mm -hmm. in pursuit of higher well-being or happiness. But then at the end, you veered back to the importance of, of freedom. So uh, in, in a world where the pursuit of choice and, and freedom can actually harm our well-being, yeah. such as on climate change, how do we make the trade-off? Is it, is it well-being? Or is it freedom? And uh, we can see this playing out in how different societies are organized, uh, whether take Singapore and China, mm. where they'll argue they may restrict freedom in pursuit of higher well-being, or the U.S. Tea Party, which will uh, harm well-being by shutting down the U.S. government in the pursuit of some notion of, of freedom. So how do we make those uh, trade-offs? Well, I think I don't have a better answer than that is what politics is about. Politics is an endless conversation and debate about a set of trade-offs. I mean, as I, I quoted Amartya Sen, the, the right to decide which work job to do, 
what to consume, what to produce is an element of freedom in itself. But then you immediately say, okay, suppose what everybody wants to consume is more and more flights across the world for which we do not have, unlike some other aspects of uh, CO2 emitting things, a technological response. Um, you know, how do we constrain that? Well, the answer is we are going to have to debate that. We're going to have to decide that as societies. And we're going to have to balance that also, I think, with issues of, uh, of equality and, uh, and, and fair shares. And we may have to end up with uh, a sense of uh, a certain number of rights to emit CO2. Uh, with, if you want more of those rights, you've got to buy them off other people. But that is, that is what politics is about, is, is attempting to resolve these incredibly difficult conflicts between the desirability of people being able to make choices, free choices, um, and, and the consequences of those, those choices. So I'm afraid I don't have a better uh, answer than that. Um, and if you spotted inconsistencies in my lecture, that's because there are almost certainly some there. And at all. Uh, Anatole Kolesky. Well, I, I don't think there were any inconsistencies at all. I no. think there were some inadequacies. So. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> No, no. Uh, I, what I want to do is just uh, suggest to you maybe one more point that, uh, where you could have taken it further, which is you pointed out three, uh, very convincingly, three fundamental fallacies in the political understanding of economics, and it goes back to the point about democracy that Axel made earlier. I would disagree with him that uh, economists uh, have taken democracy away uh, out of e economics. I think the problem is, if anything, that economists have injected themselves too much into democracy. And what I mean by that is that you pointed out three fallacies, two of which are fundamentally economic, the second and third. Uh, the claim that deregulation is always the solution to uh, accelerating economic growth, and that income inequality is a necessary condition for economic progress. Now, given that those two observations are obviously not true for the reasons you gave, either empirically or theoretically, how is it that the economics profession, which we are all part of, have allowed th those fallacies to be perpetuated, have in fact fed those fallacies, have uh, continuously reinforced those fallacies in politics over the last 30 years. You know, what is the political deformation that has turned professional economics into a lobby group for a very narrow and clearly untrue understanding of reality? How is it that economists have not stood up against the, the Laffer curve, for example? Yeah. Uh, and I would love any comments on the sort of sociology. And you know, we've heard a lot about regulatory capture of regulators. <coughs> but has the economics profession not been as much subject to capture by special interests as any regulators? I think I'd make, I'd make two comments. Um, one of which is about a sort of cognitive capture, but other is about an interest capture. And this may be a bit controversial for some people, but um, on the sort of cognitive capture, cognitive capture can occur by the attraction of an all-embracing system. And I think the fact that uh, the three tenets which I'd suggested provide you with a maximize, a maximand, a mechanism, and a way of focusing on in, you know, a pure incentive mechanism. That's attractive. It appears to be an internally consistent system. Uh, off you go. And it, it, it goes with the mathematical bias. So that's a, a, of much economics. So that's a, that's a bias in a particular uh, direction. I think the, the other point about the, the pure cognitive stuff, the pure ideas point of view, um, is the fact is people are, are influenced by what they're reacting against. And I think probably too much of the economics profession back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s was in love with um, socialist and planned economy senses. There was then a generation of economists who went to universities in the 60s and 70s and said, I don't think this is particularly sensible. And they imbued a, a certain belief that, uh, you know, I've got the new idea and the new idea is markets. 
And one of the dangerous things that intellectuals are sometimes subject to is to take ideas which they found interesting uh, at an early formative stage of their career and to devote themselves to the endless uh, variation of, uh, of uh, 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 various... I mean, let me give you an example. I truly do think that within uh, the, the area of privatisation, you get literally civil servants who, once they've been through two privatisations, they've got the technology, they've got the theory, they've got the language, they just want to find something else to privatise. It's just, you know, they, they keep going uh, in, in that direction and they sometimes move beyond the things where privatisation is clearly value-creative and sensible to the things where it's, it's not terribly value-creative. That's one point about cognitive bias, tendencies that people have, etc. On interest bias, I actually think it is a problem that the predominant uh, employer of professional economists outside academia is the financial services industry. And, I mean, let me be clear, you know, I've got nothing against economists working for the financial services sector. Some of my best friends. <laughs> I wouldn't mind my daughter marrying such a person, and I... Wouldn't mind if one or two of them moved into my road. Indeed, I think some of them may have already. But so I've got nothing against them. Um, but the fact is, however decent and reasonable people they are, it is unlikely that if you are an economist working for the financial services sector, you are likely to allow your ideas to develop in the direction uh, which suggests that you know, the scale of the financial services sector has grown to a socially non-optimal level. And I think that is a bias, which unfortunately we do have within the system. Well, uh, to finish up tonight, I, I mentioned that I like learning and, and I need to, you to clarify a couple of things for oh, me. Right. Uh, the first of which is uh, you said that Keynes recommended more leisure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did he practice what he preaches? Oh. <laughs> I've never quite worked that out. I think he did sometimes. Yeah. I mean, his leisure was always, as I understand it, but Robert's here somewhere, he'd know. Uh, it, it was always very active leisure. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't sort of shooting the breeze with the your buddies down the pub. He stayed uh, in bed until noon. He what? He stayed in bed until noon. He stayed in bed until noon. Well, okay. there he is. He would not have been at the 7 o'clock session. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well the... the <laughs> And the other, the other thing that I, I need you to clarify is that uh, I thought I had worked it out that Keynes recommended that I devote more time in the coming year to proprietary trading on my own account so that I would be less aggressive in pushing all of you next year into a long conference. But you just described how when I run INET, there's a difficulty because if I start to get involved with the financial sector, yeah. it might constrict my imagination. How do I resolve this? <laughs> That's the trickiest question of the evening. <laughs> but I'm sure you will resolve it brilliantly. <laughs> well, I, should, I think we can all say that uh, for a second year in a row, you executed your task for INET brilliantly. So thank you for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Well done.